I'm Sean Roberts, Chief Technologist for Lincoln Network, and this is Lincoln Shorts. Earlier this week, I spoke to Corey Doctorow, Special Advisor to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Corey has written extensively on interoperability and, it's, and how it's key to allowing new tech and companies to develop. I asked Corey specifically about competitive compatibility, which he's also defined as adversarial interoperability, and this is our conversation. Hope you enjoy it much as I did. The idea here is that um, if you look at the growth of the big tech companies, that historically what they've done to get big was by making something that plugged into something that already existed. So, you know, when Apple was worrying about Microsoft locking them out of the office market, they didn't beg Microsoft to make uh, a better version of Mac Office. They just reverse engineered the Office Suite format and made iWork so that you could plug into it. But now all of the companies that have succeeded through adversarial interoperability, whether that's you know Microsoft uh, and its interoperability with various IBM PCs or Apple and interoperability with Microsoft products or Google and pretending to be a web browser and visiting every web page in the world and making a copy of it when it was starting out as a search engine, um, they've all pulled up the ladder behind them. And so what we're proposing is that a lot of the problems that we're facing today, maybe not all of them, but a lot of the problems that we face today with competition could be resolved if we gave people a defense against uh, legal regimes that are used to block interoperability, whether that's software patents or copyright or exotic forms of copyright, like Oracle now says they have a copyright on APIs or there's the DMCA's ban on circumventing DRM. All of those kind of add up to a thicket of laws and rules and interpretations that have been erected around the technology world. And what we propose is that there should be some immunity for people who want to get through it. I mean, maybe it could be statutory, right? Maybe we could have a law that says, notwithstanding any other law, you're allowed to uh, add new features to an existing product without permission from its manufacturer, provided you do so without violating other laws and you're acting on behalf of a bona fide user. So you're doing something for, for the user and not for your own parochial gain. It would still be hard to adjudicate, but at least we'd be asking judges to answer the interesting question, like, did you do something good that was otherwise lawful on behalf of a legitimate user and not like, did you violate a patent? which is a boring procedural question that doesn't answer the policy questions. It could also happen through procurement guidelines. The government could say just, we're not gonna buy any software unless it has those, those stipulations. You have to promise you won't invoke any of the legal rights you have against interoperators if you wanna to sell to us. That's a very powerful lever. It could also be uh, a, um, a remedy within findings of uh, antitrust violations, monopoly violations. So when the FTC enters into an, a consent decree with a company that has been monopolistic, part of the, the way that that company makes it up could be by promising to lay down these weapons that some were deliberately fashioned by the government and some were sort of crafted out of ambiguous laws that had uh, new interpretations fashioned by very deep pocketed large firms. So you see this as a possible partial solution for the antitrust discussion, at least putting it on more uh, modern grounds. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, when, when people talk about antitrust and tech, one of the things that you sometimes hear them say is that uh, tech has this unassailable advantage because of first mover advantage and network effects. But, you know, the, the network effect that, say, like Facebook has, where everybody who wants to use a thing like Facebook is using Facebook, could also become a, a disadvantage, right? When, when Facebook started, they made bots that would log into MySpace on behalf of Facebook users who still had MySpace accounts that would fetch their waiting MySpace messages right. and let them reply to them from Facebook. So MySpace's walled garden became actually a corral in which Facebook could go and raid you know, the, this, the, this, this reservoir of potential social media users that had been neatly arranged in searchable corpuses by the dominant player. And, and they could use them and just siphon them off. So, you know, network effects are powerful, but they're a little different in tech because, they, because of interoperability, because this, this distinctive characteristic of computers where because of, you know, Turing complete von Neumann machines, all computers are in some sense equivalent. So um, there has been some discussion that, um, and there's been some evidence that this could be somewhat of a solution. Um, of implementing some of these ideas through APIs. Um, what's, what's your thought on how, how that would work out in the marketplace? 
Well, APIs are a great floor on interoperability, right? All the things that a firm uh, is willing to share, or, you know, if you look at the Access Act, what they're saying is like, take all the APIs that you already have that you use on your own backend. So like whatever Facebook uses to talk to WhatsApp and, and Facebook Messenger and, and Insta, take those and expose them to your competitors. Because presumably they're designed to ease interoperability not to confound it, right? Facebook, Facebook doesn't want to confound interoperability between Facebook and Instagram. So they're designed to, to be good vehicles for interoperability. But if Facebook was mandated to do that, there'd be a strong incentive to change the way all the stuff on Facebook worked so that the API touched less and less of it. So it became less and less of a remedy. Um, you know, on the one hand, uh, uh, an interoperator's defense or, or a system whereby this kind of competitive compatibility could be realized would, would be a hedge against that. You know, if you were using an API to access something important and then they changed the way that they worked so that the API no longer touched it, you could just get it through another means or you could try, you could hire engineers to try. It's not that Facebook couldn't hire engineers to stop you, but uh, they couldn't ask the court to stop you. That's really what we're saying here is that like, allow the technologist to, to do battle with one another, but, but don't get the court in here. Um, and, and the other thing is that it might stay Facebook's hand, right? They might say like, well, we could nerf this API and make it less functional for uh, competition and compatibility. But if we do that, we're just going invo to get involved in this like grinding war of attrition with rival engineers who are, who are going to keep taking the same stuff, just not with this managed narrow API that has been at, it, you know, if it's a thorn in our, our side, at least it's a quantifiable one. We know how it works, as opposed to like our adversaries now just like write scripts that try to get at the same stuff without um, telling us about it and without us having any way to even know who's doing it. Okay. So you see this as being uh, part of the tools that need to be employed to be able to ensure that there's competition. Yeah, I think it produces a better equilibrium. It produces an equilibrium where companies know that if they're really terrible, that um, their customers can choose not to leave the company entirely, which is a big choice. You know, it's a pay, it comes with a high cost, but maybe to go to a competitor that'll allow them to access the part of the company who, that they like without making them uh, surrender to the parts that they don't. You know, I always think of like, my grandmother was a Soviet refugee. And when she left Leningrad, she didn't see or talk to her family for 15 years, right? There are a lot of people who could have left the Soviet Union, but didn't because the cost was so high. It, 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 they did the calculation in their head and they decided it was worth, it was worth staying even if they didn't like things uh, altogether. But, you know, I emigrated from the United Kingdom here to Los Angeles like five years ago not only do I call my in-laws in Wales like every weekend, but we even got to take our appliances over, right? The appliances that we really liked, we just bought transformers for. And so lowering the switching cost meant that um, I could make that choice. It was less momentous. I can still do the parts of British life that, that I, I miss and that I like. Um, and, and so it made the choice a lot easier to make. And, and so it, it means that the people who stay really wanna stay and the people who go can go without bearing these very high costs. It's a great example. Well, that's I think a good way to close it out. So thank you very much for your time and uh, looking forward to talking to you more about interoperability and uh, possible solutions that can be implemented. That's great, well, thank you. Thanks, Sean, thanks, nice to thanks talk to you. Thanks for your time, Corey. All right, bye. And this has been Lincoln Shorts.